Hello and welcome to the Minds in the Frontline podcast, brought to you by the Wayne State University Frontline Strong Together 5 program. I'm Jeff Lassers, one of the hosts of the Minds in the Frontline podcast, and I've been a professional firefighter, paramedic, educator, and content creator for over 19 years. Minds on the Front Line is co-hosted by Mike Matter, who is also a professional firefighter and paramedic with over 17 years experience. In addition, Mike is a peer support team member for his fire department and the Frontline Strong Together 5 program, as well as the chair of the Michigan Professional Firefighters Union Behavioral Health Committee and a board member of the Michigan Crisis Response Association. Mike has training and experience with frontline worker mental and behavioral health. On the other hand, I do not. My role is to produce the show, whereas Mike is our resident subject matter expert. Together, we hope to inform, educate, and entertain first responders, their families, and the public regarding the realities of frontline work-related mental and behavioral health challenges. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Dr. Ali Amr Sadri back to the show. Dr. A is the medical director of the FST5 program. He brings a wealth of knowledge from his role at the Wayne State University's Department of Psychiatry and is the Associate Chair for Clinical Services. We are also pleased to introduce you to Dr. Andrew King, whose extensive credentials speak volumes about his expertise in the field of toxicology, emergency medicine, and substance use disorder. Dr. King is an associate professor of emergency medicine and medical toxicology at Wayne State University, located in Detroit, Michigan. He also serves as the medical director for the Tolan Park Opiate Treatment Program at Wayne Health, providing vital treatment options for those grappling with opioid addiction. As the medical director for the Michigan Poison and Drug Information Center, Dr. King is at the forefront of addressing the immediate challenges posed by exposure to toxic chemicals and substances. Additionally, his role as an inpatient addiction medicine service provider at DMC Receiving Hospital further underscores his commitment to combating substance use disorder head-on. Dr. King and Dr. A are here to shed light on substance use disorder, or SUD. Beyond the casual use of substances like a glass of wine or a social drink, substance use disorder represents a significant shift. It's marked by an escalation in use that begins to affect every facet of life, from work and school to personal relationships. It's important to keep in mind that substance use disorder isn't just about alcohol. It's about excessive use of substances, including cannabis, sedatives, hypnotics, anxiolytics, inhalants, opioids, hallucinogens, stimulants, or any other substance that leads to academic, social, or occupational impairment. During this episode, we'll take a deep dive into how substance use disorder can take hold, its impact on control over use, and the resulting physical, psychological, and social consequences. Dr. King and Dr. A will guide us through the intricacies of substance use disorder, its effects, and the importance of recognizing the signs. This turned out to be a great episode, and we appreciate Dr. King and Dr. A lending us their time and expertise. Please check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and make sure to like and subscribe to all Minds in the Frontline podcast social media channels. Thank you, and enjoy the show. Good morning, gentlemen. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to the show, Dr. King. How are you? I'm, I'm well, thank you. First time, long time. Right, and Dr. Yeah. A, welcome back, sir. Thank you, sir. How are you? Great. How about you guys? We're doing great. Doing good. We're hanging out with you today. We're talking about a very interesting topic, but before we do... Let's start with you, Dr. King. Who are you? What do you do and where do you do it? Mm, I like that question. There you (laughs) go. Uh, I am an associate uh, professor of emergency medicine and medical toxicology over at Wayne State University. I'm also the uh, medical director here at the Tolan Park Opioid Treatment Program. uh, And I also do inpatient addiction medicine consults over at the Detroit Medical Center. And I've been doing this for about three, four years. Uh, now. So, and I also uh, work as an emergency physician or had at least predominantly for the first uh, 10 years of my career. Uh, so have a bit of insight into what it is like to be a frontline worker. Right on. Absolutely. I was going to ask you, yep. what is your connection with the frontline community? How has your experience been learning about us? Well, it's uh, I trained in Pittsburgh. And so that was a pretty heavy frontline EMS integrated residency program. And so we would uh, go around in a um, uh, SUV, and so we'd respond to like all the frontline stuff. And so what I know what it's like. We've been to a lot of fires, a lot of shootings, a lot of cardiac arrests, and so we got to see firsthand what it's like to be there as uh, you know, fire and EMS are doing their job. Uh, we also did a lot of helicopter transports, uh, picking people up in the field, etc. 
So I get an idea of uh, exactly what y'all go through. Yeah, a lot of people don't realize that Pittsburgh and the surrounding communities is a very progressive fire EMS system. Big time. Yeah, it was an amazing experience. And I did some assistant medical direction when I was a a resident for one of the uh, community programs there around the area. And so we got to do a lot of QA, work with the EMS crew there, um, did some ride-alongs, a lot of ride-alongs, but mostly it was uh, doing a lot of the, we called it the Jeep. We would get some calls, we'd answer some like basic uh, questions if they had to check in with the doc, uh, but we'd definitely go for all of the cardiac arrest and more interesting stuff. I got to say a lot of my residency uh, colleagues had way more interesting stories than I did, like delivering animals on the side of the road, oh, wow. putting oh. chest tubes in. But I got a fair number of stories too, but I really enjoyed that experience because it gave you a lot of insight into what EMS ends up having to do and especially fire and uh, terrifying. Yeah, for what you do, you really need to have the true insights. You can't get that from just me telling you about it because so many people are in our industry are so humble. They're only giving you the parts that either might make you laugh or the stuff that you're kind of looking for. But when you see it, you get to see a side that even the person who could tell you the story can't tell you. It's so important that people in your communities that are going to treat people in my community totally get us. And it's nice having them ride along. You that's know what, what I mean. I mean. That, that's like huge. I mean, that doesn't that's when happen. You, get the, 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 you know, a little, little fun in the engine house, and they get oh, to yeah. hear the fun stories. Yeah, they get, they the get coffee the, table. All the they good get, stuff. They get the full experience. Yeah. yeah, they get the full experience. These uh, these helicopter rides. I remember these. You know, we were so there's usually like a nurse or or a paramedic, and they're flight trained, right? And uh, you know, we would hang out in some hospital or some base somewhere. We were on 24 hours at a time. You're sleeping in your flight suit and your boots. And so it's alternating between getting a call and like getting ready to go and watching a lot of cable television. Yeah. Well, with the, it's been, I don't, I don't know minute. what you're talking about. Right. Uh, I, I don't, we don't do yeah. that. We do Netflix and YouTube. <laughs> well, this was a long time ago. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. You're dating yeah. yourself yeah. there. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's funny that uh, the culture, how it's changed with the entertainment devices within our industry and how we kind of tend to cope with that sometimes. Guys yes. get buried in their phones, and that's a form of uh, substance abuse in a lot of ways, right? Oh, you yeah. Know? But before we get on to that topic, Dr. A, same question for you. Who are you, what do you do, and where do you do it? Remind everybody who you are. Uh, first of all, I'm the medical director or uh, Frontline Strength Together program, FST5. In addition, I am a... Wayne State faculty associate professor as well. And I hold the position of uh, associate chair for clinical services and also chief medical officer for the Department of Psychiatry. I have been involved with first responders for 30 years or so. And I never forget my first experiences that I had with them because I knew nothing about the complexities that they go through. And uh, they have been my teachers all along. I still. Um, think often about the police officer I was treating who also had uh, alcohol issues. Very nice gentleman, nice family, and we were not able to help him as much as I wanted to. And Finally, he ended up homeless and Gosh. lost everything he had. Hmm. I still think about it. How long ago was that? 30 years ago. Wow. And that's yeah. been imprinted on you ever since? It is, it is all there. Yeah. Has that kind of led you down this road of continuing yes. with your work? Yes, yes. That has been, uh, still is an education when I think about it. That's powerful stuff. Absolutely. Very powerful. Well, let's dive into, yeah. you know, the unfortunate countless people that have had that experience of going down that road. So to really kick us off, Dr. King, you have a background in substance use and abuse. And I don't mean that recreationally. I mean that as a doctor, right? Right. Although I don't know. I didn't know you in college. But could you provide an overview of what substance abuse and substance use is and maybe compare and contrast the two as well? That's a great question. Uh, the definition of a of substance use disorder, which we prefer to use now, is uh, when it becomes a problem. An easy way to think about it is if you have the three C's, just to remember, uh, is if you lose control, you have consequences, and you have cravings for it. And so it becomes one of those things that is the center of your life and your thought process and where a lot of your money and time goes into, and it causes consequences. So not just health consequences, but interpersonal consequences, um, consequences on the job, et cetera. And then you have a difficult time controlling it. Like even though you may acknowledge that there is a problem with it, it's still you still use it despite all of that. So it could be from an overdose or loss of job or getting censured or getting into fights with your uh, significant others. Most of your paycheck going to that, you, uh, you know, losing recreational opportunities. So instead of like going bowling or 
uh, having social uh, ventures that you normally would have. Instead, you're just you know using substances and coming down from it. Uh, there is a physiologic component too, which we conflate a lot. That is part of the criteria for substance use disorder, which is dependence and, and tolerance and withdrawal. And we need to make sure that we're, we're dividing those two things. So when people say chemical dependence, sometimes they'll conflate that with actually a substance use disorder. But dependence really means that is a, a process, a physiologic process that you can't control. Is that if you're chronically using something and then you stop, all the compensatory mechanisms that your body uses to try to get yourself back to homeostasis takes over, right? And you have the withdrawal symptoms. So you get like the sweats or the shakes, uh, nausea, vomiting. It depends on the drug, but you get all of those symptoms, which could be pretty darn miserable. And one of the reasons that people can not stop using because they hate those symptoms, right? They want to make them go away. And so that's, that's the dependence part. So the part of, we need to remember that if anyone has any withdrawal symptoms, they do have dependence and it doesn't necessarily mean they have substance use or addiction disorder, but they have the physiologic components of it, right? For example, I have caffeine dependence. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think it causes a problem, although a lot of my, my money goes to it. Yeah. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, right, I have a headache and I'll feel sluggish. And then until I have some caffeine, then I feel normal again. And that technically is a chemical dependence, but it's not causing problems in my life. I'm not getting in trouble with it. I'm not losing job or employment, right, Dr. A? That's what from, from my caffeine use. <laughs> <laughs> not yet, but we have to talk after this podcast. <laughs> uh, and, then, and then tolerance, too, is like increasing the amount that you need to take for the same effect. And that's just that's another physiologic phenomenon, too, as well. It might be a little bit more subtle than that, but those are the the main um, terms that I wanted to make sure that we use. And so when people use substances, like alcohol, for example, would be the most common one. If you look at the definitions for substance use disorder or alcohol use disorder, you can do this pretty easily online. It's mostly just like checking boxes to see if there's a problem. Um, you know, there's a good amount of people that, that do drink and would qualify for a substance use disorder that don't really need to necessarily seek treatment, although they might have some benefit from it. You know, alcohol is just objectively not good for you in large quantities. And there's some debate about whether small quantities are actually good for you or not too. And those become really kind of difficult studies to go through in general. You know, you'll see those hit the news every so often about like, is a glass of wine before you go to bed beneficial for your heart or your blood pressure, et cetera. And so you get a lot of conflicting data about whether should I be drinking, should I not be drinking? It's ubiquitous. It's everywhere. You can't, at least in you know, this state, you can't not run into like a convenience store or grocery store or just a straight up party store. And it seems to be just so easy to get into. So the access is incredibly prevalent. And then there's like a, in our culture, it's okay, right? There's a lot of drinking uh, that you see modeled in popular culture, like movies and TV shows. It's a modeled behavior that we see on some of the people that will watch on television or, or uh, talking about streaming services today. I don't want to use any particular names, but you know, you watch your favorite one and you'll see something bad happening. You see them party and there's usually some alcohol involved there too. All that stuff kind of makes it okay for people to drink and then to drink in excess because people have stories about it. It's part of like the college culture. Um, and then of course, once you go into uh, frontline or some places where there's a lot of stress and places maybe where you can't decompress because you don't have the ability to work it out and have the discussion that you probably should be having after a stressful uh, event, you go home and like your significant other may not understand quite what's going on or you don't really want to talk about it with uh, your colleagues because it'll make you look weak. So there's a way to make those bad feelings go away or drown them or kick the can down the road. And so it's easy just to, to do that, right? And a lot of times when we're off because we have crazy schedules, it's lonely time. And because we have uh, such erratic schedules too, it's hard to build in like some normal social interaction that we have with the normies. Is that mm -hmm. the right term we can yep. use? And yep. so, so, you know, so you have like this weird random Wednesday off and nobody's there because all your friends are either working and your kids are at school uh, and, and your significant others is at work too. So then what do you do? Right. And so it, these are a lot of the, the triggers. Uh, you might be stuck with yourself and some memories and things that you can't work through or just complete boredom. And these could be triggers for people just to, oh, why not? I'll just pour myself a cocktail and just relax. And it could become real subtle. The transition from just drinking casually to a real substance use disorder can be real gradual and can be difficult to know when that inflection point is where it turns into a problem where you're developing consequences. And of course, the physiologic component can happen before any other issues. And then it also depends on your subtype, right? Is this a binging subtype where you don't necessarily have withdrawal and you don't drink it every day, but you're still creating consequences and problems because of your behavior? 
Um, or is it, you know, every day, like I get my eye opener and I'm quote unquote functional. It's one thing, but then objectively, are you really functional? Like subjectively, in your own mind, I'm doing okay. We said, we were talking about before, I show up to work, I complete my job, uh, I'm there, I'm there the entire time. But then when I get home, I start drinking and then I've cut off all relationship with the rest of my family. But, you know, we utilize the job and the performance of the job as really the only metric for our functionality and our success and forget that it is a detriment to the rest of our universe and the rest of our lives. Yeah, and I think that's one of the biggest things when we talk about in the first responder community, and you hit the nail on the head, is the people who come into work, you know they're, they're partying or drinking every single day that they're not there. And when you go talk to them about it, they're like, well, I, sh- I show up to work. I'm fine. I'm good. You know, I only drink on my off days and, and this, that, and the other. What they have to realize is that, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but you, that's still a substance use disorder that where the only days you're drying out are the days you're at work. You know, you only have to make it 24 hours to that next drink. And I think it's sometimes lost amongst the first responder community that because I can show up, I'm on point when I need to be at work, I'm doing what I need to be doing, then they're like, I'm fine. There's no problem here. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. There is a big problem there. You're just functioning right now. But eventually, will, will that lead into non-functioning but, and you're at some point? you're functioning just at work, too. Yes. Right? You're not functioning the other parts of your life, which are just as important. Right? But we do, as frontline workers, I think we place a lot of importance on our ability to perform our job, right? Our duty. And our duty becomes very important for us to, like, show up. And, you know, we're doing nights and weekends and holidays and stuff because we want to be there for the people who need it, at work, right? But we're not taking care of ourselves, and we're not necessarily taking care of our families, definitely. You know, it's okay for us to treat ourselves because I need that, right? That's the idea. It's like, well, no, I, I need that to function, right? Like, that's my coping mechanism, but that's not a great coping mechanism, right? It's an unhealthy coping mechanism that causes a lot of collateral damage throughout the rest of our lives. Uh, and it's, a, again, a culturally acceptable way for us to cope with the stuff that we've seen because we don't really have a great outlet anywhere else. And so that's the idea that's been built up in our head. And if anyone says anything otherwise, you know, there's a psychological reaction. They're like, no, it's fine. What's wrong with you? Like everybody else says it's okay. I see it on TV. See, my heroes do it. Why can't I do it? And they're able to get up the next morning. They throw the aspirin in the big bottle. They chase it. You've seen this movie a thousand times. That's exactly right. right. Yeah. Always the, the protagonist wakes up with a hangover. Right. right. And then the anti bunch of yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 He rolls. Right. I feel like it's every late eighties, early nineties, you know, action movie. A hundred percent. I want to add uh, a few points here. One is the, the most or significant amount of drinking for pregnant women is none. So if there is a first responder who's female and is going to become pregnant, they have to be very, very, very careful. That's one point I want to make. The second point is that even those who drink maybe three, four times a week, maybe one shot, and those who binge and maybe just three or four, if you measure their cortisol level, which is the main stress hormone the day that they are not drinking the cortisol level is high so in other words although they do not have withdrawal symptoms but their body physiologically is responding so that is the subtle way that you are going step by step to become a little bit more and a little bit more closer to drinking these are uh, i believe important although i'm sure many people won't like what I said right now, but this is the fact. It has been proven. Well, anytime you disrupt a cultural party favor, that can tend to rub a few feathers. But I do want to ask, we, you know, we focus on alcohol, and again, that's a pretty American thing to celebrate or to be somber with alcohol, right? Especially in groups, and we like to latch onto each other and drink together. But alcohol isn't the only thing on the table here. What other substances, especially in 2023, are we seeing more and more human beings in the United States lean on for use and abuse disorders? Uh, My goodness, I don't think that there is really a limit to what we've seen uh, people use, right? I think, I can't remember, but you can misuse just about anything out there. The same thing with like toxicology, right? Everything is toxic. It just depends on the dose. But, you know, things that we have been running into, alcohol probably be number one. Uh, and then, of course, prescription pain meds all the way through other opioids, including heroin. And there's usually a progression from 
prescription pain meds uh, because we threw our back out or we got a leg injury or something like that all the way through. And then I started buying off the street because my doctor cut me off and then uh, heroin is cheaper. And then so you'll see that progression happen very commonly in a lot of the patients that we take care of inpatient and outpatient. And then nitrous is real common in in Detroit now. I've been seeing a lot of that that's in the gas stations. Uh, If you go to uh, any of the off ramps, just open up your car door and look in the ground and you'll see a whole bunch of silver canisters. And then that's nitrous or like in certain parking lots. Uh, that's a big deal. And we're seeing a lot of people uh, get into nitrous and develop essentially a B12 deficiency. It's a functional B12 deficiency where people cannot walk. They get tingling in their lower extremities. Sometimes they'll present with primarily psychiatric disorders. Uh, we're starting to see that with pretty significant frequency there. And it seems to be something that people are not really aware of either that are using nitrous because it seems like it's a harmless gas that you'd get right that you get at the dentist's office it's something that you the doctor might give you for a procedure but it becomes uh, and has become a big problem in this area other things like dust off there's a essentially a halogenated hydrocarbon in there that people can use to get a little bit of a buzz and they will use that in excess and that can cause some cardiac dysrhythmias and of course benzodiazepines sleeping aids those kinds of things, dextromethorphan, cough medicine. I think the list goes on and on. And there's a lot of other prescription and do you medications. Think some of those like. downers, I understand, is uh, a way to finish the night for somebody using uppers, right? So you probably see a lot of compounding of these things. It's not like I'm, oh, you know, tonight I'm going to do benzos. No, it's usually like an arc of, you know, crossfading, as the kids call it these That's days, it. where you have a bunch of stuff for the specific time of night and how you want to feel. Thank you for bringing up the stimulants because I totally forgot about that one. But that is one, you know, uh, people uh, can misuse their amphetamine, whatever that might be for focus. And it turns into kind of a substance use disorder after a while that may or may not be recognized. And then you're right, there's like the combination of them. Usually people have a drug of choice like this is my favorite thing. But the I think the, would you call it cross? You call it crossfading. Crossfading, yeah. yeah. So, you know, uh, that was like, a, I think it, it, it started with, uh, bikers, they would drink a lot and then they would do amphetamines to stay up so they can keep drinking, right? Sure. And so that would keep the party going. And then we'll also see people who do a lot of cocaine, they'll start getting a little bit, they'll call them like tweaky and they'll want to take the edge off of that. So they'll start taking an antipsychotic or like a benzodiazepine to take the edge off once the dopamine tone gets to be a little bit much for them or they start feeling a little bit edgy or uh, paranoid. Uh, so that's right. So, you know, you can use that at the end of a, a binging type phenomenon for any of those, right? They become their own pharmacologists in a way. They do. Yeah. And it's really interesting. A lot of people who use drugs uh, have a really amazing insight into pharmacodynamics and pharmacokinetics. And then I just have to use the right words with them and you can see the light bulb going off. And they said, that's exactly what's going on with me, man. It's amazing. In fact, I had a teenager who used to call herself because I asked her, what do you do, et cetera, and said, I'm an experimental pharmacologist. She was using a okay. whole lot of substances of different types. Yeah. So you're right on. We used to call those drug dumpsters. Yeah. Hers is more poetic. Yeah. <laughs> but the point that I wanted to make is we, as physicians, need to, co- to take ownership of some of the problems that people are going through, including first responders. For example, after surgery, the safest number of days is reported people need to use this five days. I rarely have seen people having less than 10 or 14 days. That is too many, too many days. That's number one. Number two. And that, I'm you, sorry, sir, but that's the days of... Uh, days of prescription. Right, right. Okay. Right. Like pain medicine after pain surgery. Pain medications first, after yeah. surgery when they are discharged. Right, yeah. The other part is that, unfortunately, again, uh, many of the pain clinics recklessly were prescribing these medications and... People were just used to going there, get their medicine, and after there were some restrictions on these types of prescriptions, these people ran to heroin and other things that is uh, endangering their lives. Nowadays, we are seeing more crack cocaine again coming back as well in this area. It was devastating 20-some years ago when I was working in the emergency room. I saw so many lives in front of my eyes, vanishing over several months because they were usually coming in there to ask for help. And the other part, which is so uh, important for us to realize, is that, as you mentioned, many people will have a stimulant and then a downer. Those individuals who use crack or cocaine and then drink, 
really what they are doing is they are destroying their liver because that combination is the most dangerous combination for your liver. Those are the points that I think uh, I wanted to make uh, in addition to what Dr. King said. That's a good point, too. I wanted to, to dovetail off of that and say that um, sometimes the physician-enabled uh, behavior of using pain medication can make it really difficult to have that conversation with a patient because uh, they'll push back to say, well, my doctor prescribes it. It can't be a problem. My doctor prescribes it. And whether or not they know that it's a legitimate doctor, is that a good word? to use well, one doctor a doctor who is able to optimize their patient there some are less good at that <laughs> yeah. and and so they'll use that and so uh, it can be really difficult to have the discussion with them like i think this is becoming a problem where you've developed a substance use disorder and the, the complete dismissal of that because it is doctor prescribed right and there is a lot well, of you're work. the kook in that part right exactly yeah, i have wrong. a medical professional who has told me i'm good and now you're the problem for telling me it's not right the medical community has been really pushing back, and you know it all is in a pendulum. So there's been a lot of pushback and guidelines now for post-operative pain control, just like Dr. A was alluding to, is that you should only have a certain amount of pain medication distributed to you after a surgery, and that can really minimize the exposure to opioids, right? And same thing like from emergency departments, you'll see these alternative to opioids only or these non-opioid EDs where uh, people are being prescribed either zero opioids or like it takes a lot to get out of you because we're trying to minimize the exposure, right? If people are not exposed to it, they may not realize that they like it. I remember this quote to uh, one of my colleagues who works out West, who also does, has a very similar practice uh, to mine. He tells his kids like, don't do drugs because they're bad. Don't do drugs because you might like them and you might like them a lot. And that's the thing that concerns him, right? Just like that, that first exposure to whatever that drug of choice happens to be that works best with your body, that could be it. And if you can minimize the first exposure, then hopefully you can minimize the amount of people that can go on to develop a substance use disorder. I can identify with what you said. I had a back surgery many years ago, and after I was discharged, I was given Tylenol 3s. I took one pill, just one, and I felt so good. <laughs> as, as I felt that way, I said, okay, that's it. And a reason I throw it away. Addicted. Yeah. yeah. And we, that, that's a really good point, too. I'm glad we're having this conversation. I need to say this, too, is that there are so many medical providers that will look at patients that have substance use disorder and they will use like very stigmatizing conversations or stories, right? Like, I took a, I took a hydrocodone one time and it made me feel sick. I don't understand how these people can get into it. That wasn't your drug. Right. That's yep. not your yep. thing. That wasn't, yeah. It's different for other people, yeah. right? And so the lack of empathy sometimes could be really difficult to deal with. Yeah. Oxy to me, and I had a back surgery too, I had an L4, L5 fusion. And one Oxy, I'm like, I'm going to puke my brains out. This is not my drug. It's like tequila is not my drug, right? Oh, I can yeah. handle a little bit of oh, vodka yeah. way better than tequila. It's just my chemistry. and People forget that part. Right. And it's interesting too. I haven't had, you know, thousands of these conversations when they, you can ask them about their first exposure to that opioid and that was the first time that they felt good and normal and funny and their true self and it's hard not to want that experience again and so as opposed to what we think about taking an opioid to make you kind of uptunded and sleepy and slurred etc it's not that for them it could be very energizing and activating and that would be a hard thing to not want to experience again so i'm glad that you could bring that insight doctor but at the same time uh, when i was in the hospital for uh, that problem, they used to give me morphine, and I was begging them not to give it to me mm -hmm. because it was lowering my blood pressure. I had headaches, everything else. That's interesting. You might have been better off. <laughs> I well, I stopped it. I <laughs> 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 yeah, back pains. That's no joke. Uh, just like back pain, everybody gets it, and it happens to be a higher rate in the frontline strong five community, right? So let's get into that same correlation. Is substance abuse more or less common? for the Frontline Strong Five communities than it is for the general population? I don't know the exact numbers, so hopefully no one is going <laughs> to quote me on this. <laughs> I don't have the exact numbers, but I think we have all of the risk, risk factors for development of substance use, like more so than, uh, say, like a, a normal comparison group, right? Much of our personalities are novelty-seeking. We are, you know, looking for the, the new thing. Um, sometimes, you know, adrenaline junkie, to not to use that quote, but that's a, a, a possible issue that we can run into. We're also at risk for seeing and experiencing some very traumatic things uh, that we don't know how to deal with. And then the culture surrounding a lot of the, the um, frontline 
work is pretty masculine, right? Even to the point where it's like toxic masculinity, like rub some dirt on it, walk it off, like you'll be fine. And, uh, and so you're not really talking about the problems or working those things out in a, um, appropriate manner. What's that famous saying in psychiatry? If you don't uh, deal with something in a healthy way, it'll come out in an unhealthy way. Does that I sound have to think about that? I don't remember. <laughs> I, yes, I do right? remember. Isn't I concur. That? I concur. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and so this is one of the deals is that we're not, we're not dealing with these things in a healthy manner, for example, or uh, we're not having the conversations with our colleagues that we need to because we're either isolated for whatever reason. And then it's easy to make those things go away. Like we talked about before to turn to a substance. So I think all of those are really strong risk factors to make prevalence much more common in frontline workers than, than other jobs. Well, I think also it's built into our culture. I mean, Mm -hmm. first responders, we, we go out and party for everything for good and bad. So you, you get off probation, there's a party, you get promoted, there's a party, there's a retirement party, there's, Hey, we had a good fire, let's go party. But on the flip side, it's, Hey, we had a bad run, let's go to the bar. And that's built into that culture of first responders that it's the socially acceptable thing to do for good things and it's socially acceptable for bad things. And that really sets up that whole, it's okay. It's probably pretty common, right? It's the same thing in our uh, specialty too, is that, you know, you'll see some stuff. I think, you know, to give our specialty credit to like emergency medicine, I mean, is that, you know, not everyone does this, but they are starting to at least pay some lip service to if they see something terrible, like if there's a code, like everyone that was involved in that code should talk it out a little bit and make sure that, you know, they share some ideas. So it is at least um, dealt with in a little bit of a healthy way. But then, you know, how much time can you spend doing that? Because there's always a flow coming. And so that's difficult to, to take that time out to actually process things appropriately with the colleagues that were there. Absolutely. And I, I, one thing that comes to mind in talking about like the peer support stuff like you're talking about, just talking about it after a run. One of the first call outs we ever did, it was for a, a child death so we went in there we did our diffusing did our thing whatever and a couple of days later i don't remember what it was it was a probation party a retirement party whatever maybe it was a party and everybody's out at the bar and i'm sitting there with a couple of the wives who had no idea that we went out and did a diffusing and they were talking about how they had this bad run a couple of days ago and one of the things I'll never forget, and when I knew, this is when I understood when peer support actually works. The wives were talking, and they go, yes, uh, such and such, you know, they had that bad run, blah, blah, blah. But it was really weird. Normally, he would come home and drink for four days after a call like that. And he hasn't done that this four-day. And myself and another guy on the peer support team looked at each other across the table, and it was like, okay, so this stuff works. This is where it's at. But like you're talking about, it's huge because it's finally starting to turn into that where we are a little better at talking about it now. It's kind of a little more acceptable because before that, that stigma was there. And when that stigma sticks, nobody's going to talk about it. So I, I'm glad you brought that up where even in, in the hospital-based stuff, it's getting to the point where, okay, we're, it's okay to start talking about this stuff. And it does make a huge difference. Yeah. You know? So what is the correlation between stress, depression, trauma, PTSD, and substance use and abuse. What is that link that gets us there? You know, I, th- this whole conversation makes me think about, you know, how much of the things that we are exposed to because of the job and the duty that we feel that we're supposed to do lead us to seeking substances as a you know, way to compensate, right? And just the general culture. So it's all connected. And, you know, I can tell you that I still wake up in the middle of the night and remember cases and things that I've seen. And then, you know, you can imagine that uh, if people had a bad run or something, they're trying to get themselves to sleep because it's still, it's still working it through their mind that they will turn to a substance to go to sleep, right? And then that seemed to work, so I'm going to keep doing that. I don't need to talk to anybody because I can show up the next day and I can sleep, right? And so this becomes, a, so, you know, not to use the term too flippantly, but a slippery slope. All of these things are interconnected, and I think the first part is to acknowledge that we deal with some very traumatic things, and there's a lot of trauma associated with what we're doing, and of course, the fear of litigation, doing the wrong thing, hurting somebody, having the guilt that's associated with that, just trying to process some horrendous stuff that like you're never going to get out of your head. Like, How do you be able to process that appropriately and uh, with people who also get it, right? And so these are, there's many things that I can't talk about with my wife because I know that she just wouldn't quite understand, right? 
but then you can talk about it with like another EM physician or a paramedic or, you know, anybody who is a front line and then they get it and it helps a lot. And, and the last thing I wanted to, this just reminded me too, for, for police officers, I was uh, sewing a prisoner up and we have a special module where all of the uh, prisoners and uh, the, you know, the police or whoever arrested them. And sometimes the, the guards are there. And it was interesting that they formed their own circle and they started going around and just talking about the experiences that they saw. So now I was just sitting there just quietly listening to what they were going through. And then some of the stories that I heard them talk about is not even close to anything I've experienced seeing, you know, some of the worst traumas coming into the, to the ED. Uh, some of the things that they have to see out there with like less support, how terrifying that must be and then how they were able to either deal with it or not deal with it. And I thought that was just an amazing thing that they ended up doing it themselves. From, you know, different departments, they didn't know each other. Some of them were guards, some of them were... Yeah, and they're doing it like they're shooting the shit, right? They don't know they're in a circle of therapy. Most of the time, (laughs) it's a bunch of dudes. Yeah, man, check this out. When I was here, I've been in that... I used to work in an ER in Pontiac, and uh, we had a very similar contract with the Oakland County Jail. Yeah. And there'd always be, you know, four or five guys, and then you get BSing. Like, you know, people in our industry do. And then you start having these sessions where you're talking and getting stuff out. And it feels good. It does feel good. It's like, oh, it's great to hang out with you. What yep. you really mean is it was great to communicate with another human being and express our feelings and kind of do this emotional it's handshake. A, yeah. yes. That's really what we're saying. And that's why it is so important for people to get involved in peer support, ask for help. And we have to expand the peer support specialists in any way that we can. Because yeah. it is effective. I have uh, some points uh, when Mike was talking about the culture. Uh, before I go there, uh, there is one other piece I want to say. The question that you asked deserves probably three or four sessions. Yeah. The last <laughs> question <laughs> you asked. Yeah, there's yeah. no quick answer There to is why. no way we can respond to it or do a good job at it. So going back to the culture issue, when I see uh, a substance use individual who is struggling in my mind there is no substance abuse but trauma so for me any person i see i say trauma and that trauma doesn't need to happen while they are at work or when they joined the forces it can be from the beginning of their life so that's something which we really need to focus focus on the issue of uh, trauma the gentleman that i mentioned to you guys i saw 30 years ago the experience that he had, it was not the only experience, but the experience that he had, I cannot talk about. But it related to a child. And when you were talking about children, also is important. We did a survey, and the most traumatic experience that people could recall, number one, for most people, was children. Now imagine that the individual has a child about that age, and that will be devastating for individuals. And how can they cope with it? Probably they need to forget it. How they're going to forget it? Go to a downer. And that's part of the culture. The other part is that you talked about celebrating and all that. The question is why? And the why is because we have a stressful life. And in order to master the recovery from that stress, even if it is a short term, is going to forget about it. Hanging out, cracking jokes drinking, going home, feeling bad. And the other part of it is, uh, Dr. King was mentioning something, and it is worth talking about, and that is to talk to our partners, life partners, wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, and make them understand that when the first responders go home, he or she needs his or her own time. However. The first responder needs to learn to talk to the partner because that partner is wondering what is going on inside of his partner. And that is why uh, marital problems and frictions come up. So these are all very important parts that we really need to focus on. And again, I go back to peer support and strengthening them. If you can do one thing, is to get engaged with peer supports. And it is of absolute importance. 
the last piece that uh, I wanted to talk about is a study was done and they had rats in a cage. Rat in a cage on its own is traumatic. They need to walk around, do things. They put one bottle of water, which they could have, and a bottle of butter with cocaine in it. Of course, what happened was all of them went to the bottle which had cocaine in it. Then they did one bottle of water and intermittently one bottle of water, sometimes cocaine, sometimes not cocaine. Still, they went to the intermittent one. They used the cocaine. They changed the condition. So instead of being in that cage, they provided a bigger family. They provided better support for them, a better environment. And what happened was none of them went to the cocaine. Why I'm using this example is that if we try to improve the environment that first responders are living, the way that we have to help them, understand them, let them talk, support them when they are in pain rather than labeling them, having attitude or etc. And even with the environment that they have in their station, for example, firefighter, police officer, dispatchers, there are many things which we can do to reduce the effect of trauma. For example, I went up north, in fact, and went to one of the dispatch centers. A dark place, everybody sitting around, no light. The first thing which came to my mind was, I wonder how many of these people are depressed. Not because of the job that they do, because of the location that they're living in. The second piece which came to my mind, well, okay, if they don't have a window or two, why we don't buy some bright light therapy boxes and put in there so they can have the benefit of light. Why? Because we are, if we want it or not, we are sun worshippers. Sun is so important for us because of the biological rhythms that we have. And if you mess up that rhythm, your body is going to be stressed and you are going to be stressed. And then you need to recover from it. How? Artificially by substances. So these are some of the points that I think I wanted to make before I forget, because responding to your question requires hours and hours. Yeah, I think I totally agree with you there is that, and it, it's funny you bring up the, the study in that capacity, because I was just talking about this yesterday, about how your environment leads you to make a lot of your choices. Yeah. Because if your environment makes you happy, you're not really sitting around being mad, thinking about doing bad stuff. And sometimes it's not. It's not a choice of a substance. Sometimes it's going and doing something that's just not healthy for you. Like being mad all day and sulking isn't as good as being happy and going for a walk. And those things compound and they stack on each other just like good habits can stack. Which goes to wellness programs that you guys need to have. I mean, departments need to really pay attention to these parts. Wellness programs and the environment that the first responder is living. These are of absolute importance. He's talking about the rat park experiment yeah. too. So I want to make a plug for this. And there's some, some really well, um, there's actually even a comic strip that describes what the rat park experiment looked like and exactly how important the environment is, right? People, rats at least, won't seek substances at all. And in fact, they'll undergo withdrawal. They won't actually attenuate any withdrawal symptoms that they might have after becoming dependent on a substance because they're able to interact with other rats. They're in a stimulating environment. They are happy, right? And and so all of those old commercials that tried to demonstrate how bad drugs were because, you know, the, the rat would hit the button until they killed themselves from the cocaine, that was in the context of being them in a wire cage, right? I would do the same thing if I were stuck in a wire cage all day, every day, right? But then, you know, you do the things that we're meant to do, which is interact with other people, be communal, be stimulated, and all of a sudden, substances don't need to be part of your life. This reminded me of another rat study, <laughs> <laughs> which is very pertinent to our discussion. They had uh, uh, some rats in different cages, in different places, and uh, they put them on high cholesterol diets. And of course, many of those cages in different places, the fats had high cholesterol and gained weight, but one place, one cage. So they videotaped what happens in this area. And what they saw is that the individual who was feeding them was 
paying attention to them, was caressing them, talking to them, etc. Again, goes back to care and being available, reducing the amount of stress that people are under. And if that happens, our first responders will become healthier, their lives will become healthier, our communities will become healthier. Why? Because an angry first responder, a depressed first responder, a traumatized first responder will not make the best decisions that he or she can make. So that goes a long way. Okay, so now knowing that uh, a lot of these problems can be, uh, you know, present in our community and maybe a little bit more in our Frontline Strong 5 communities, what treatment options are available for these people? Help us dissolve the walls of people not asking for help. Because a lot of times just knowing what the treatment experience is going to be like, the easier it is to let people in and they'll go willingly. I think it really depends on um, where you're at, where, where this where people are listening in the department specifically, there might be specific resources for there, but you know, there, and it depends on the the severity of the disease, right? And we try to match the severity with what people want. And sometimes, you know, you have to be a little bit more in the gray. It's like, what are people willing to do? Um, Because I think something is better than nothing, Uh, but it can start from just um, doing support groups and and counseling sessions to a doctor's office visit where you're getting prescription medications to help with cravings, et cetera, uh, all the way to, you know, more intensive outpatient programs where there's a lot of therapy, a lot of medication, um, and then inpatient programs where you are, uh, you know, just working on yourself and you are inpatient somewhere and then even partial hospitalizations or, or, or periods of time when you're gone um, from the things that potentially stress you out. So you can really uh, get back to, you know, who you are for months at a time. So it's all really dependent on what the person might need, what they're willing to do, what they can do based on their circumstance. And so it it really just starts with the conversation though. And then in terms of specific frontline resources, I was going to defer to you all about what potentially where they could go. Fortunately, unfortunately, we've had these conversations with people on the frontline workers and a couple of the places that they have right now, number one, you can call the frontline strong, um, phone number one eight three three thirty four strong and you can start talking to somebody about the different programs in the area or in your area. For the fire service, we've got the Center of Excellence out in Maryland. And that's a uh, that's a dual enrollment. So like you guys talked about, the trauma and the mental health portion go hand in hand with the substance uh, use disorder. And they take care of both. That's a great place to go. It's specific for the fire service. Another place in the area that's down in Columbus is called Fortitude, and they take care of first responders as well. They've got a whole first responder track, so it doesn't matter if, uh, whereas the center of excellence is strictly fire, Fortitude is everything. It's police, fire, EMS, dispatch, you, you name it, any frontline worker, that's where you can go. So those are some of the, the different area things in the area. I know specifically, you know, we work in the fire service. The IFF actually has online support groups for substance use. Even if you can't make it out to Maryland, but you want to talk to somebody, boom, we jump on the Zoom meeting and you, you're there with a whole bunch of other firefighters talking about your substance use. So those are, those are some of the options in the area. And really, just go find one of your peer support people to start with. You know, a lot of times the peer support people know the, the ins and outs of what's around there. And like I said, if not, you got Frontline Stronger Call who's got resources. You know, if you specifically don't know, call the number and they'll get you 24-7. So. They also can go to the website and yep. we have many locations that they can choose from depending on what they need, where they are, both. However, one other part which came to my mind is that we should always uh, think about comorbid illnesses that they have when it comes to alcohol or other substances. The issue is that many times uh, people who have alcohol problems will have depressive symptoms. And that is not a quote-unquote major depressive disorder. It is a depression which is being caused by the substance. And number two, many people who have depression also get to drinking, and then it worsens the situation. Or if they are without symptoms, they will start having symptoms. So this goes hand in hand with anxiety. The same with bipolar illness, the same with trauma and PTSD, the same. So these are things that should not be neglected. And if someone goes for treatment, they need to receive treatment for both of them. Absolutely. 
That was great insight. We appreciate you guys very much, and obviously he'll be back very soon. All right. Yeah, we got to finish this conversation. <laughs> we're going to, well, obviously, we, I think we're opening up to the fact that there's way more to this conversation. Yes, I mean, we I can think get we just coping skills and the use of these substances to do that. And I think there's other things we do that are just like substances that are the same thing. Yeah. And you're getting to the fact of those activities might be yeah. causing depression rather than the depression Absolutely. leading to that. Absolutely. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, honestly, I think that we need to push for financial and political reasons the issue of changing the environment for first responders. They need to support it. It is of absolute importance. I really felt so bad when I went to one of the locations. I think I don't remember if I was with you or Christy when people were sitting around like being in a prison. Yeah. And, and the that's dispatch the other center? Part. Yeah. Dispatch, yeah centers dispatch centers tend to be extremely dark places where you can grow mushrooms. Yeah. It's really weird. It's dark. It's <laughs> got like a dampness. Yeah. It's like a dampness. It's 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 never there's no plants. <laughs> there's there's no lights. It's never a nice place. Why shouldn't it be an atrium? I don't understand why dark we're in basements. Lights, <laughs> caffeine and fast food. Yeah. yeah. That's right. That is a dispatch center. You know what I, I was thinking about this the other day too is um it, I mean like the E D, for example, where you have like a bell that goes overhead like if an emergency is coming in and same thing like you know when we were doing helicopter rides like an alarm would go off right yeah. you're sitting there and it just seems to be the worst kind of environment is that you're sitting there kind of at a high alert state waiting for something to go off that may or may not happen that may or may not expose you intermittently to something super duper traumatic and like you're supposed to do that for a prolonged period of time right. and then like once your shift is over like you're supposed to be okay you're supposed to chill out and be totally fine you are right. on like heightened alert for this intermittent potentially like negative reinforcement. And that really seems, that reminds me like a lot of other rat studies out there where yeah, you're just, yeah. you know, causing learned helplessness and you're, you're causing yeah. just, you know, intermittent punishment, for example. And yeah. that, that's just, that whole idea is a bit unhealthy yeah. that people are exposing yeah. themselves to that. Like day some other day rat day. experiences come to mind. <laughs> oh, right, right. We, you know, we're going to have to do an episode just yeah. on rat experience. Rats and first responders. Yes. Not about New York. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you guys very much for coming thank on. You. We appreciate you very Thanks. much. Thank you. thank you to Dr. King and Dr. A for joining us on the Minds in the Frontline podcast. We hope everyone enjoyed this episode. We have more great content coming out soon. Please check us out on YouTube, Instagram, and Facebook, and make sure to like and subscribe to all Minds in the Frontline podcast social media channels. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.